Let's get started today with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for allowing us to be together in your house. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it provides to us for our homes and for uh, our church as we think of the homes that make up our church and then as we think of the opportunities that we have to uh, have, a, a, a gen have generations that follow on to serve you, we pray you'd help us to uh, have a right perspective of all of these things in our lives, our individual preparation and what we bring to uh, the home in, in marriage, uh, the relationship between parents and children, relationship between spouses. Help, help us to have a, a Christ-honoring attitude and deal with these things in a Christ-honoring way so that we can have success and fruitfulness in our lives and in our marriage uh, and not... Uh, uh, difficulty and heartache and discord and divorce and all of these things that come along with uh, the following our lusts and living for our lusts instead of living for you. Uh, we pray that you'd help us to understand these things and then to put them into practice. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right, we're on resolving conflict. And we remember just by way of, uh, from current slide, from, by, uh, for, uh, remembering to bring us back up to speed that when we are dealing with conflict we're dealing with disappointment in in each other and the other in, in, in our spouse and we think of all the different things that our spouse can do to us and to hurt us or that causes frustration in our lives and then we realize that probably we did those things too and they probably have felt that one, at one time or another from us and so this is the reality that we have to to uh, deal with that whatever we think they're doing, we've probably also done, or we probably also have given them that perspective of us. Uh, we need to be careful that we don't think that our spouse is the only one who's ever done these things. And when we have that attitude, then we can't see clearly. And sometimes we'll even say it with our lips, but we don't really believe it with our heart and with our mind. We'll say, yes, I know I've done wrong too. You ever heard someone say that? But then you're totally discounting what, what, what you've brought to this. So how are we going to deal with conflict biblically? How are we going to deal with it biblically? And the first point, remember the three C's. Remember, why do we boil it down to three C's? Because when we get in conflict, we can't see straight. All we can see is red. So we have to get down to basics. We have to get down to the very small details that are foundational and rudimentary so that I can have someone to fall back on so I can start to make my mind see clearly and I can understand how I ought to react. But because I'm not gonna be able to process all of these things because I'm upset, I'm angry, I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been grieved, and I'm, 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 I'm sad by this thing, whatever it is, and so I have to find out how I'm gonna react. So the three C's for, for dealing with conflict in marriage, number one is, one is control or change. Now here's the question for you, who can you control? Can you control your spouse? No, we can't do it. We try to, and that just makes the conflict worse. We try to respond by controlling the situation. I want to have control of this situation that seems out of my control. I want to have control over this person who seems out of my control, even though I know that they're my person. This is my husband, this is my wife, and so I want to control them so that they are what I want them to be. And I want to apply the pressure of change to them, but we can't do that. We can't control them, we can only control ourselves. We can only change ourselves. And of course, when I say change ourselves, we wanna filter that through the truth of the uh, fact of the matter, which is that it is the Lord who can control us and change us. It is the Lord who can tr control and change our spouse. But I can't control my spouse. I can't control my wife. She can't control her husband, me. And you can't, your spouse either. We, as much as we would like to, now we can force some things to be more like we would like them to be. We can pout or we can yell or we can, we can act in a way that causes our spouse to do what we want them to do by force or by manipulation. We can do that. But ultimately, that does not lead to clarity in a relationship. It doesn't lead to fruitfulness. It just leads to more problems down the road. It leads to more problems down the road. And they come up, and when they come up later, they're bigger because these things are deep-seated. It leads to bitterness and it leads to that which is seething underneath until it erupts like a volcano. And so we can't just try to bully our spouse or manipulate our spouse into doing what we want them to do, and they do what we want them to do, so now we think everything's great. That's not really resolving the conflict, that's just, that's just suppressing the conflict. 
And that's, that's not going to stand you in good stead long term. And it breeds problems in your marriage later on. It breeds problems in your children because they see that. They see this problem going unresolved. What do you think that they do with their spouse once they get married? They do the same thing. And so they're not resolving problems either. They're not resolving conflict either. Remember, conflict is always a result of sin, but it can be constructive in our lives if we respond to it in the right way. We can be edified. We can be built up. We can grow if we respond to conflict in the right way. And that's what we must do. And the more we do that, the less conflict we'll have if we have a Christian marriage, and, and the easier it will be to resolve conflict when it comes uh, because we have, are able to deal with this in a spiritual way. So who can I control? I cannot control my spouse. I can only control myself. And we looked at some scriptures on that, which many of the scriptures apply to multiple of these points, but they're helpful. You know, we're, each one of us is going to give an account for himself. We saw Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias answered for himself, and Sapphira answered for herself. She had opportunity to change and to do right and to come clean, but she followed her husband's lie. They were both responsible for their individual uh, part, uh, part of the partnership of sin in their lives. So control is the fir- control or change is the first C. All right. Often the husband thinks subconsciously that he can manage or reason or even bully his wife into changing into his own desired way. If I yell at her, or if I'm uh, mean to her, or if I pout, whatever it is, he I can get uh, uh, project strength. You know, I can get my wife to do what I want her to do. Or the wife thinks subconsciously she can manipulate or emote her husband. Maybe. Maybe she thinks I'm more intelligent than my husband, and she might be, okay? I look at some of you, and I think, yeah, that's probably, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, Our wives are intelligent. They're smart, and God made them that way, and we value their intelligence, and their intelligence is a blessing to us, but wives, if you use your intelligence against your husband as a tool to manipulate him, then you're not dealing with conflict. You're taking leadership. You're subverting leadership that you ought not, and we sometimes do this subconsciously because we're just falling into uh, 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 living for our, our lusts, desiring what we want to desire, wanting what we desire. We're not thinking sometimes maliciously toward our husband or toward our wife, but we're thinking selfishly about our own desires. And so we end up doing the same thing. Whether it's malicious intent or not, we end up doing the same thing because I'm just trying to get what I want out of this. I want my agenda push. I want my way forward uh, to be that which we take. So she can manipulate her or emote her husband into changing into her desired way. Uh, do, do you think that women, a woman would ever emote her husband into changing in her desired way? Oh, yeah. Or even, even uh, someone who's not her husband. What about Samson and Delilah? Didn't Delilah emote Samson into doing what she wanted him to do? Uh, she she uh, caused him to be weir- we- weary of her weeping. And men are, men are weary of weeping. Now, uh, that's not to say that men always have to cave to that. But the point is you can manipulate your husband. Don't do that. These things we try to do to control and to change our husband. Or even, even women do shout and yell and scream. And so these are not uh, relegated only to husbands or wives. They each can do the other. And so the scriptures never instruct a husband or a wife to change his or her spouse. This is the work of God. Uh, God tells husbands, love your wives. He doesn't tell you to change your wife or to control your wife. He says, wives, reverence your husband. Honor your husband, submit to your husband, obey your husband. He doesn't say control your husband or change your husband. That's not your responsibility. That's God's responsibility. You can facilitate that in them only by controlling or changing what you can in yourself. Okay? Only by controlling and changing what you can in yourself. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This this point is where we left off last week. We finished with uh, Ananias and Sapphira there. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not. So here we understand what's going on here. We have a husband who's believing. And this would apply alternately also as well. A a wife who has a a husband who's believing, uh, not believing. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. What does the culture and what does our own heart tell us is the best thing to do when we have the conflict, even of a lost spouse? Our heart tells us, and the culture tells us, you guys are not happy together. You are not compatible. Have you ever heard that? 
you're not compatible with one another and you need to make a change here so that you guys can both be happy and successful and fulfilled in your lives. This is what the culture says. God doesn't say that. God says, even if your spouse is lost, you ought to stay with them. If they'll stay with you, you stay with them. That's the instruction from the Lord. Now, how much more if your spouse is believing should you stay with them? But God makes the clear, clear command that even if your spouse is unbelieving, that you stay with them even in conflict. If they're not willing, desiring to be separated from you, then don't you cause that to happen. Uh, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Uh, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. So you want your husband or wife, you want to have a great relationship? That's going to come when your husband or wife gets saved. You're going to have a better relationship. Not that you can't have a good relationship, even with a lost spouse. But you want to have a good relationship, and you want to have a, a believing spouse? What is the best thing that you can do? Leave them? Is that going to bring them to Christ? No. The Lord says stay with them, and you're giving them the best opportunity to be saved. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. In other words, the blessing that God brings upon a wife uh, transfer over to that husband. And now he can see the goodness of God, and he can see the, God, the grace of God working in his wife's life. A husband that stays with his wife even though she doesn't believe in God and he's living for the Lord, that is an opportunity of the Lord drawing her to himself. And not only that, but now you have your children recognizing a, a, a believing spouse, whether it's their father or their mother, who's honoring the Lord. And they're able to, be, uh, they're able to witness that as well. Else were their children unclean, but now are they holy. What happens if you have children? And you leave, and they're now with their unbelieving father or mother. Are they going to be going to church with them? No. Uh, when, they're, when they're having you know, split time, as we do in our culture, that's not going to happen. So the, Lord's, the Lord's instruction is always right, but it also makes sense once we follow it down the road and we see the results of it. Uh, this, is a, this is the important thing for us to recognize. My behavior, my behavior is the best challenge to my husband or to my wife if I want them to change. Who can you change? You can change yourself. But the best way for me to facilitate change in my spouse, which is all I can do, is to live right myself. All I can do for my wife, all she can do for me, is to facilitate change in my life. And that's all you can do for your husband or for your wife, is to facilitate change in their lives. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. This is saying basically the same thing in a different way as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, or I'm sorry, chapter 7, he said, If any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. What conversation? Be in subjection to your own husbands, that kind of conversation, that kind of lifestyle. So you want your husband to change? You want him to be saved? Then be in subjection to your husband. That's the best way for him to be saved. And that's God's instruction. That they also may, and this is not a promise that this is absolutely going to happen, but it's the best opportunity, they all, that they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Uh, they're, they're able to see your purity. They're able to see your holy conversation, your sanctified life, your purity before the Lord. They're able to see that. They behold it. They witness it. Your chaste co conversation coupled with the fear, coupled with fear, and here, uh, especially the fear of God, but even submission to the husband is, is part of that fear, as he says in verse 1, subjection to your own husbands. Uh, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting out of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So you're, uh, and this, this, would, this applies to husbands as well, we're under the observation of two. First, he says that the wife, or that the husband will behold the wife's chaste conversation. 
and we can make that application too, couldn't we? If it's a man with an unbelieving wife, couldn't the wife behold his chaste conversation or his righteous lifestyle as a man? Could she not behold that? Okay. But she, uh, she's one who sees it, or he's one who sees it. The other is the Lord. Look what he says. In the sight of God, this is of great price, in verse 4. So God's watching, too. And, and, he, and he goes on, verses that we've uh, talked about as we went through this passage. But these are, uh, these are uh, opportunities for us. Verse 7, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Dwell with who? Well, to the wife, but also the unbelieving wife. We can carry that down from verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 1. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So again, your communication with God is at stake, and also your heirs together of the grace of life, the gifts of life, all that God gives us in life. And when you operate under the sphere of God's leadership and under his control, under his authority, with our spirit, with our attitude toward one another, we're being a conduit of God's grace to our spouse. And we're allowing God's grace and goodness to work and, and a, be a benefit to both of us because we're one flesh, not separated. So it's very important for us to recognize this. Our behavior is the most important. Our personal behavior is what we can change. And that's the best thing for us to change if we want our spouse to change. He's doing this. She's doing this. Yes, of course he or she is doing this. How can you change them? Uh, you're probably you've already tried to reason with them and that hasn't worked. Probably you've already tried to manipulate them or control them, and that hasn't worked. It's not going to, ultimately. Only the Lord's way really works. And the Lord's way is right whether we see it working or not. It's still right. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Verse 18. And these are, this is just blanket instruction. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord, and husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Nowhere in here does he tell us how we ought to, what we ought to do in order to change our husband or our wife. He just tells us what we ought to do for ourselves, right? What, what righteous perspective we ought to have toward our spouse. Love your wives, as he says in Ephesians 5. He says it here in Colossians 3. And be not bitter against them. Don't be hard against them and have a bitter spirit toward them. And wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. The best opportunity for a happy marriage is to obey God for yourself, not for your spouse. You can't do it. You say, why do you keep saying this over and over and over again? Because we have to keep telling ourselves this over and over and over again. Why? Because conflict comes on Monday, and then it comes again on Wednesday, and then it comes twice on Thursday, and, so we get, and we get forgetful. So we have to keep reminding ourselves that this is how I have to behave. I have to change myself. Lord, change me. Help me control myself and not my spouse. I can't do it for them. I've got to do it for myself. All right, who, who you can change is yourself. So the three C's again, who you can control or change, not your spouse, only yourself. And now I want you to see character, the second C. All right, because conflict is not about my spouse. Conflict is about me. All right, this is a continuation of what we've already talked about. Con conflict is not about my spouse, it's about me. It's about what God is doing in my life and how I'm going to respond and grow when this thing I don't like is put in front of me. When, when, when the alarms are going off and the lights are flashing everywhere and everything is uh, unsettled, how am I going to respond in that situation? And this is what happens when we have conflict in marriage. All of a sudden, that which is peaceful and supposed to be nice and, you know, uh, happily ever after, brrr, it, it, it's interrupted. Now how am I going to respond? I have to recognize what God is doing and God is working on me. God is working on me in this conflict. So do I want the conflict resolved? Yes. And do I, may I have, or, or a, a, may, may a husband or may wife have legitimate grievances with the other? Sure. And there are ways to bring those out and we'll talk about that. But at the core, I have to recognize in that conflict, you have to recognize in that conflict that God is working on you individually. God is working on you as an individual first so that you can have a happy marriage. And so it has to do with our character, our own personal character, what I am and how God is confronting and changing me. What I am and how God is confronting and changing me. 
when we come into the marriage, and especially we should remember this when it comes to conflict, but we are both different. Uh, men and women are not the same. And it's not a, it's not a big, it shouldn't be a big uh, news flash for anybody to un understand that. I don't know why in the culture we're trying to act like anybody can be anybody they want. Men and women are not the same. They're not wired the same. They have different viewpoints. Now there may be, some women are uh, like certain feminine things more than others and some men like certain masculine things more than others, but there's a great difference between men and women. Biologically and, and spiritually and emotionally and in every way, there's a great difference. Uh, we're, we have different viewpoints. We bring them to the, into the marriage. We have different viewpoints. I think this is the best and wise path forward. And they think this is the best and wise path forward. Who's right and who's wrong? Well, whatever my view is, the right, is the right view. Is, is the right view, right? We, wh whoever, wh whoever has the view, that's the best view. To them, that's their view. That's their viewpoint. That's what they think is best. And we bring different viewpoints in. There's, there's, you ever heard that statement, there's more than one way to skin a cat? I'm sorry. There is. I don't know all the ways, but I'm sure there's a bunch of different ways to skin a cat. And, uh, right, Brother Morgan? More than one way to skin a cat. Uh, that's a little joke. They have a bunch of cats that they've accumulated all of a sudden. But uh, the, the, uh, the point is, there are different ways of approaching and tackling a, different, a, a, a given thing. And, uh, or of navigating through life. And we're gonna have different paths on that. So we have to recognize that. And husbands, just because we have a certain viewpoint and, and we think and know that our way is gonna rule the day at the end of it, doesn't mean we should not consider the other. And maybe change, maybe being willing to go that way, or maybe being willing to alter this way for something in that way. We have to be careful about that, but we have different viewpoints. We have different opinions, different likes and dislikes. We had a different upbringing. Uh, our parents parented us different. We saw something different modeled for us than the other did. Maybe somebody had loving parents, and so they expect their, their wife to, or husband to just respond lovingly to them and, and, and correctly to them because they saw that modeled by their parents. But then somebody else had parents who were, they had a dysfunctional home, and they were always constantly fighting, and they were rude to each other, and they were uh, ungodly to each other in many different ways, and so, now the other spouse is doubtful of their spouse, thinking they're doing what their parents were doing. Uh, all kinds of different things are factoring in our upbringing, and that carries with us through the rest of our lives. You think, well, we've been married 15 years. Don't you think that will change? No, that, those things get carried through, and it might be diminished, it might be suppressed, but those things are gonna, they, you have to factor those things in. Uh, if you do this, you start to realize things about your own character, and even things about your spouse's character, but we have different habits. Different ways we've learned to do things. By the time we get married, we've already established some habits uh, of uh, doing this. You know, there's, there's the old argument of whether the toilet paper should come over the roll or back under the other side of the roll. You know, or what was the other illustration? Uh, you say, oh, the, to the toothpaste. You just squeeze it, you know, or do you roll it up from the bottom? Sometimes it drives people nuts, uh, depending how their, their husband or wife does it. Uh, I'll give you one that my wife does. It drives me nuts. Uh, she piles all of the dishes in the sink. They're like all in the sink when she's cooking, when she's done cooking. So you can't even do anything because everything's all twisted up together. Isn't this just a terrible way to do it? And uh, just can't believe she would do it that way. And so then I come along because I'm helpful me and I do this all the time constantly, you know, uh, to help with the dishes all, all the time. And uh, I come to help with the dishes and now I have to take everything out so that I can wash something, right? And her perspective is you've got this stuff strewn all over the place. I cannot even work because you have it everywhere. And wh why don't you just put it in the sink? That's what the sink is for. This makes no sense to be spreading it out all over the place. Now, who's right? I'm right, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, but you see, we have different ways of doing things, different habits of doing things. And if you're not careful, if you're not careful, then those things can become part of even bigger things. Because you always do this. You never do things something the way I want you to do it. And now we have a pattern of selfishness from one to the other. And by the way, she still does that with the sink. It still bothers me. And I have learned that this is, this is the way it is. And it's her kitchen, so I do it her way. And I mean, I still leave it out. But I don't, I don't complain when she does it the other way anymore. Uh, and you know, a, 
I'll, I'll just say, what, what do I do? Oh, I, I leave the cabinets open. Why do I do that? I don't know. Uh, and she says, she'll come in the kitchen and she'll say, hmm, my husband's been in here. You know, she says it out loud. And uh, I'm like, oh, I must love the cabinets open in there. And uh, she's, but she's just teasing me, you know, but these things you can see if you don't deal with it correctly. Uh, and probably at some time in your marriage, either at the beginning or maybe some time, you know, you had a real conflict over some of these things. And it's usually connected with something else. There's usually a bunch of other baggage that's all put into one uh, big old sack and you're carrying all this weight around with you. And then you tr start dumping it on each other, don't you? When you have a, a, a fight or when there's other conflict and it just starts all pouring out. You have a lot of trouble, but you have to recognize this is part of their upbringing. The, this is habits that they've uh, brought. They have, we have different responsibilities. My wife has totally different responsibilities than me. Your husband has totally different responsibilities than you. Uh, you. Caring for the children, working in the workplace, these are different responsibilities. Uh, different different uh, uh, personalities. You know, some are happy, some are grumpy. I'm grumpy. Uh, uh, some are, and some are just, you know, uh, uh, don't get riled easily. Some are high strung, you know. And this can cause conflict if we're not careful. It's about... Now, now, none of these things that we've mentioned so far, just in and of themselves, are sin issues. But they can become sin issues. They can become sin issues. All right? We have different hobbies or pleasures, enjoyments, things that I want to do, things that the other spouse wants to do, that you have to make time for, or expect them to make time for, or expect them to take care of something else so that you can go do these things. Or do, or recognize that. But they have theirs too. You're not the only one. Uh, different physical conditions. Someone may get headaches all the time, and that really hurts them. That really affects the way they respond. Uh, when uh, you ladies are, my wife is pregnant right now, and uh, she's doing okay. She's she's just tired, but some uh, I forget which one. She was really sick, and that makes responding to a situation a little more difficult, doesn't it? When you're sick, and your husband does something you don't like, ladies, isn't it really hard, dif difficult to respond righteously when you're not feeling good? And then he does that annoying thing that he always does. Uh, uh, and it makes you feel more sick. That's, it's difficult to, to respond in those times. But you have to come into discipline with those things in your life. And husbands, we need to be careful that we recognize she's not feeling good. So what she said or how she responded or what she did do or what she didn't do, uh, is, that, is, is, that, is that important? How is God working on me with this? See, we've got all these different things that are about each one of us. But God's working on me. We have different uh, uh, spiritual aptitudes and learning levels. So some, some marry someone who's been raised in a Christian home all their life. So they have a whole lot of Bible knowledge and somebody else wasn't. So they're coming along. Or they grew, grew they already learned a certain spiritual lesson in their life and their spouse hasn't learned that lesson yet. And so they have to tr try to, uh, we have to recognize we're at different places there. What we have to recognize is that I am imperfect. I am imperfect. And there are things in my life that need to change, okay? And we should ask ourselves the question, and am I angry? And am I responding in anger? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, right? Remember we, we preached on anger several months ago on Wednesday nights. Am I angry? Am I responding in anger? Is this going to help solve the problem here? I want this conflict to go away, or do I? Or do I want to win the conflict? Do I want to get my pound of flesh out of this conflict? Am I selfish? Am I living selfishly? Am, am, I, am I doing what I'm, what, my reaction right now, is it just because I want this certain thing, and I'm only focused on myself, and I'm not realizing all of these other things about my spouse, and I'm only focused on me? Am I prideful? Am I not willing to admit I was wrong or to offer repentance, have a, a humble and meek spirit here? Am I bitter? Has something happened in, in the past that I'm hanging on to that has just turned me into an angry, vindictive person who doesn't even want joy for somebody else? It's just full of hatred and full of uh, negative uh, emotion and negative thoughts towards someone else? Am I controlling? Am I just trying to keep control of this situation, by the way, which is another word for faithlessness. When I have to have control of the situation and I cannot trust God, it means that I'm not trusting God. I'm faithless. And so I think that I have to control it. Am I covetous? 
desiring something that I shouldn't have overly, uh, something I don't have overly, therefore it's something I, I shouldn't have. The Lord maybe doesn't want me to have that right now, but I'm forcing that thing to the hurt of my spouse. Am I being just rude? Uh, this is something I have to watch out for. So sometimes I'll just respond. I'm not really, I'm not really thinking uh, I'm not mad. I just respond. I have a sharp response. That's rude. No, I've not hurt my wife. Well, and that goes back to selfishness because I'm not thinking about her. I'm thinking about myself. Uh, what about uh, being envious? Something that they have or they can do, their stage in life, their, their position. Uh, they get to go do this. I can't go do that because I... I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm relegated to do this. I, I have to get up at 5 every day. She doesn't have to get up until 7.30, you know. Uh, what, what does she do all day, you know? We don't even know. Uh, uh, or he gets to go out and do that. He gets to be outside the home. I have to be here with these kids all day. And we can get envious of our others' situations. What about, am I lazy? Am I just not diligent in my relationship or diligent around the house or diligent in my life? And that's having a negative effect. But this is about my character. This conflict is about my character. Am I wasteful? Uh, I've seen many times in marriages that one, one or the other spouse is spending all kinds of money or wasting all kinds of things. And so the other has to work harder. The other is, is a, a financially minded and it's a frustration to them. But they shouldn't be wasteful. You know, uh, what about fleshly? Just totally living for whatever our flesh is, our fleshly response. That's like Ahab. He just, psh, whatever his emotion was, whatever he wanted, didn't get, he pouted and turned his face against the wall, wouldn't eat any bread. Uh, just, a, just, a, uh, mor just a fleshly driven person. When he gets what he wants, then he's all happy. He gets up right up out of bed and he eats food and he goes and, uh, and takes. Uh, you have a, a dysfunctional relationship there. What about impure? Are we impure? We can't be impure in a relationship. Am I... Am I, is there something in my life that is not pure, either, be, or either morally or either even doctrinally, theologically speaking, that is causing me to have a conflict here, and God wants me to grow through this, a change that God wants me to make in my life uh, because uh, of the, the conflict that, is, that has come up. And, God, and these things uh, declare to us, they expose to us, they manifest to us all of our sinfulness, don't they? Mar marriage is one of the, the greatest mirrors outside the Word of God to our sin. Marriage. When you get married, all of a sudden you realize just how selfish you are, just how proud you are, just how rude you are, just how covetous you are, all of these things. Lazy. No one's there to tell you before, but someone's there every day to tell you all of these things in your life. All of a sudden. And there's conflict. I don't want to change this thing in my life, and therefore... I'm going to expose something in your life. And it's like tennis back and forth, except violently. And, and you, have, you have dysfunction and conflict and, and uh, things implode. Even Christian homes do this. It's so sad. Uh, we can't, can't, can't uh, have fruitfulness in our lives. All right, conflict in marriage, whether I am right or wrong, will expose my spiritual weakness, providing opportunity for change, Okay. Conflict in marriage, whether I'm right or wrong, will expose my spiritual weakness. Not my spouse's spiritual weakness. It may expose that to us or to them. But that's not what I can be concerned with. I can't control and change them. Remember? I can only control and change myself. So it's about my spiritual weakness. It's about my character that needs to be changed. It provides opportunity for change. Uh, uh, Terry Coomer, Dr. Terry Coomer, the, the, uh, uh, my friends know them know him, uh, he says, uh, there's no change in fuzzy land, which is right. So we, we can't have this idea of, well, you know, we'll get through this, or it'll just pass. This thing, this storm will just pass, and we won't have to worry about it anymore. No, that's, that's fuzzy land. Or, I, I know I just need to be a better husband. I, I just need to be a better, well, that's not going to help you either. You need to identify the weaknesses in your life that the Lord is trying to work on you. What thing is it in your life that God is trying to change? What sin issue... What lust issue is God working on you in your life? If you find those things, then you can start to deal with them, and you can start to grow through them, and now, wow, we can find peace in our relationship. And remember, the best way to change your spouse is to change yourself. The way you're dealing with it provides opportunity for change. All right, so control and change and character. These are the 
uh, who can I control? Myself. And whose character is at stake? It's mine. God is working on my character. Go to uh, Ephesians, or I'm sorry, James chapter 2. I'm, I'm sorry, James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Here's the question. From whence come wars and fightings among you? All right, we can ask that for your marriage, all right? From whence come wars and fightings among you? You got conflict in your marriage? Well, yeah, it's my wife's fault. Well, yeah, it's my husband's fault. No. Where do they come from, James asked. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? See, we have lusts that war in our members. We have conflicting desires. As he says, the spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the spirit so that you cannot do the things that you would. Uh, we, ha we have this battle going on within us uh, between the flesh and the spirit. The lusts of the flesh and the desires of the spirit. Uh, to will is present with me, Paul said, but to perform that which I will, that I find not. Sometimes it's difficult because we have the old man with us. We have, the, we have the, the flesh still residing in us, or we're still residing in the flesh, if you will. We have the old man, and we have the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, in Christ Jesus. The, these are the conflicting lusts that are warring in your members, and lusts are warring in our members. We should note that. Lusts are warring in our members. They're not being gentle in our members. They're not uh, kind of just coaxing us in our members, trying to get us to behave badly. They're warring. It's a battle. And Satan doesn't let up. And he knows exactly what our lusts are. And so he's trying to use those things to cause us to sin. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not have hence even of your lusts that war in your members? So let me think this way. Okay, if I'm having conflict with my spouse or a war with my husband or wife, there's another war that's actually going on. And that's the war within myself, my own character, right? So war with my spouse, spouse means war in my character. And that's what I need to recognize. Okay, things are terrible right now. What happened? What is happening? From whence did this come? Don't we ask that question? Why are, why are we here? Whence did this come? They came from the war that's going on in my own members. The lusts that are warring in my own members. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Uh, we're not asking according to the Lord's word. That's what he says in the next verse, ye ask amiss. We're not asking according to his desire. We're acting, asking according to our lusts. We're living for our lusts. Ye lust and have not. So, so what we would say that we want is peace in our marriage. But what we really want is the lust of our flesh to be fulfilled. And does the lust of our flesh actually get fulfilled? No, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have. And you think, we think by killing, basically, euphemistically, my husband or my wife, then I'm going to gain my husband or my wife. Does that make any sense? But that's how our minds work when we're in conflict outside of the Spirit of God and we don't resolve it according to God's working in our lives. This is, this, is the, this is the result. It's death. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. And we are striving, fighting and warring, yet we don't have it because we ask not. We're not asking according to the Spirit of God. We're asking according to our lusts. We ask amiss that we may consume it upon our lusts. So we're desiring wrong things instead of righteous things. We're de desiring sensual things instead of spiritual things in our lives. If we would desire the spiritual things, then we would be able to have, and we would not have wars and fightings among us. And that victory would be won in that battle. And as we've said before, the more we do this, it's hard work, especially at the beginning. Uh, the more you do this, the easier it gets. You have less strife, and then the strife that you do have ends up being more like a, more like a bump in the road rather than a sinkhole that, into which we fall because we're, oh, I need to resolve this righteously. So the first two C's are control and change. Who can I control and who can I change? Only myself. 
and it's about my character. Remember that. God is working on me when it comes to this. God's working on my lusts. He wants me to change. He's not working on my spouse, or at least he might, he's working on my spouse, but he's working on my spouse, not me. And he's not working on, he's not working on me so that I can, that I can uh, manipulate my spouse. He's working on me to change me. I need to grow. And we get to the point sometimes where we think, well, I've grown enough. My spouse needs to grow. No, I need to grow, and I need to keep growing. And if I will focus on that, I'll be like, like the first Peter chapter 3 husband and wife who say, no, I'm going to honor the Lord, and that's the best way to facilitate change in my marriage. And really, we should think that way. Rather than changing my spouse, I want to change my marriage. If I think about changing my marriage, then I realize, okay, I'm contributing to this marriage. And this is how, what I can do to help change the marriage is to change myself. Now we can have fruitfulness together. You've seen that picture of a triangle, haven't you? I'm sure. You have husband and wife at the bottom, and God is at the top. And husband and wife just get drawn away from each other. How do we get closer together? We're withstanding each other. We're against each other. We're over against each other. The way we can get drawn closer together is by drawing close to the Lord. Yeah. But, we, but, by, but by staying down here in our corners, we're never going to be drawn closer together. So who can I control and change? Only myself. And God is working on my character. My character needs to change. And that's what God is working on. What if she's 90% wrong? What if he's 98% wrong? God's got 2% for you to work on in your life. Don't worry about his 98%. You can't do anything about it. You can only control 100% of your 2% or 8% or 10% or probably more like 50%. You can only control that in the Lord. You can only control that and change that. And God is working on that in your life. So if we focus on this, I promise you, because it's God's word that's telling us this, you'll have better success. If you'll both do it, you will have success. There's not any ifs, ands, or buts about it. If two Christian people will submit to the Spirit of God and submit to the Word of God in their life, they can have a joyful marriage. I don't care how different they are. I don't care how, how incompatible, quote-unquote, they are psychologically. They can have a happy marriage, a successful marriage. And remember what we said last week. If you're married, that's God's will for you. That's God's person for you. There's no, other, there's no, there's no way around that. That's God's desire for you. That's God's will for you. So... Uh, focus on making that better. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these things, how you've uh, taught me these things in my life and continue to teach me them in my life to help me in my own marriage and all the marriages of our church. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be righteous. And as we go through your word, help us to obey it. Help us not to live for our lusts. We want to live for you. And we want to have marriages that are, are demonstrating that we're heirs together of the grace of life and that we can uh, really be fruitful and multiply as your instruction was to Adam and Eve. We have the, the great, the, the great uh, practical fruitfulness, but also spiritual and emotional fruitfulness in our lives. And we have the idealistic picture in our lives of what a marriage ought to be and of the joy that it ought to bring. And yet because of our flesh, we fall short of that. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to honor your word and then be able to enjoy our marriage and rejoice in it. We thank you for providing marriage to us. It's a gift from you. And we know that even at your creation, it was something that you gave us. As a, as a benefit to mankind. Heirs together with the grace of life, the gifts of life that you've given to us. Help us to really uh, enjoy your blessing and be thankful and grateful for it and not to be ungrateful and to be uh, striving against one another. Help the wars and fightings that are amongst us to be put away from us because we are not asking amiss, but we're asking according to the Spirit of God. And whereas uh, chapter 3 tells us, we're looking for the wisdom that is from above that makes peace. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.